University, and I'm pleased to chair this session. We have uh, four contributed talks in this session, and we start with the first one by Shen Li from MIT. I'll tell her to fill in your spell electricity ST. ST, thank you. Okay. Thank you for, for the introduction. Uh, thanks for the introduction and, and good morning. Um, okay, let me come inside. My name is Xian Li, and I'm a graduate student in the Keith Nelson Group at MIT. Uh, and I, I work on nonlinear terahertz spectroscopy of condensed matter materials. Um, today, uh, I'm going to talk about one of our recent projects in which we use strong terahertz pulses to drive an ultra fast paraelectric phase transition in a quantum paraelectric material strong in titanate, or STO. So, uh, this work is done in collaboration with, uh, with Andrew, uh, who haven't been here yet. Uh, as well as Eduardo Bodini uh, from the Gaddis Group at MIT. Okay, so let me start by briefly showing to you how we generate strong terahertz pulses in the lab. Uh, for this particular experiment, we generated strong single cycle terahertz pulses that travel in free space uh, using optical rectification of 800 nanometer pump pulses in a lithium nanometer crystal. And uh, here's an example of the generated terahertz pulse. Uh, this is a experimentally measured terahertz pulse and the Fourier transform. Uh, as you can see, the bandwidth of the pulse spans from about 0.2 to 2.5 terahertz. And the uh, peak electric field scan, uh, basically, is, is here, uh, can reach 600 kilobytes per centimeter, which corresponds to a peak magnetic field of 0.2 tesla. Uh, also, that our terahertz pulse has a convenient cosine like profile, which gives it a large polarity in one direction. Uh, for linear responses, uh, Maxwell insists that uh, electromagnetic wave over time must be equal to zero. However, uh, this kind of field profile can sometimes be useful when our goal is to drive nonlinear polar proxies, such as what we are going to do for ferroelectric phonons. Okay. So, uh, so here is a general overview of the free space terrorist work in our lab. Uh, so, we, in our lab, we use strong terahertz pulses to try to control uh, various degrees of freedom in the material, such as, uh, web, such as lattice, electrons, and spins, as well as some gas phase materials. So, uh, and we always try to go beyond the linear response of the material, and that's why we need strong terahertz pulses. And uh, for in this talk, I will focus on uh, one such aspect, which is the lattice vibrational part of the story, as implied by the title. Okay. So um, uh, a number of years ago, in, in collaboration with Andrew, uh, we proposed a way to switch ferroelectric polarizations in lead titanate uh, in, on an ultra-fast time scale by using multiple terahertz pulse excitations. Today, experimentally, we, we demonstrate a new way of um, collective control over material structure in which we drive a single crystal of strong titanate from the quantum paraelectric state to a, to a paraelectric state using only a single cycle of terrorist pulse excitation uh, by driving large amplitude vibration of the paraelectric phonon in the material. Yeah. So um, before I get to the results, let me just give you some uh, brief uh, background information about STO. Uh, as you all know, uh, strontium titanate is, uh, it has a cubic perovskite structure at room temperature. And it undergoes a structural phase transition to a tetragonal symmetry at 105K. So at this low temperatures, uh, uh, two ferroelectric phonons, sophomores actually, they become a way low at Borealis on the center. And um, however, unlike uh, typical ferroelectrics, these sophomores actually never soften to zero frequency, even near zero K. And one reason for, it, for this is that the uh, uh, zero point energy for the quantum fluctuation of the ions actually exceeds the energy of the less potential barrier such that the ground state wave function is never localized. Um, so this is uh, one of the reasons why SCO is a classical example of the so-called quantum paraelectric material. Uh, however, um, we know that this is a feature when the material is at equilibrium. So our question is, what happens if we drive the phonons hard enough such that we actually push the ions far away from their equilibrium positions. Will the materials stay, still stay paraelectric? 
So this is exactly the question we are trying to answer here by using our nonlinear terrorist spectroscopy techniques. So it's an all optical experiment. There's no contact on the material. Um, so uh, for this experiment, we use uh, two complementary types types of nonlinear optical pump probe techniques, um, such that we can detect two different subset of the symmetry, uh, symmetry selective phonon responses, that the Raman active response and the IR active phonon responses. Um, the first, so the first experiment we did is the so-called terrorist field induced second harmonic spectroscopy experiment, uh, or as we as I call it, uh, TIFFISH, uh, in which we actually uh, detect. Uh, it had the terahertz field induced changes in the uh, second harmonic intensity of the optical probe pulse, uh, so that uh, this will be sensitive to the inversion symmetry breaking and therefore uh, will be sensitive to the infrared active phonon response. Uh, the second set of experiments we did is a uh, terahertz curve effect spectroscopy, in which we detect uh, the terahertz induced changes in the optical refractive index of the material such that we will detect the Raman active response. Uh, of course, for this to work, we assume that uh, the inversion symmetry holds in the material, which is indeed the case for SDO, which is quantum parametric. Um, at least at equilibrium. So uh, uh, please note that uh, in both of these measurements, they are sort of so, okay, uh, called background-free measurements, in the sense that uh, our experiment only detects the, the terahertz field induced changes in the material. Uh, by basically subtracting the terrorist on the terrorist on response minus terrorist off response, so all the pre-existing signals will be subtracted off. Okay, so let me get to some results. So here's uh, a temperature dependence of the TIFFISH signals, the TIFFISH time domain signal, and therefore a chance response. So the the phonon vibrations launched by the terrorist pulse showed up in the trace as oscillatory signals, and the non-oscillatory component of the signal uh, indicates the terahertz induced orientation of dipoles. Uh, so, uh, so note that uh, the terahertz pulse here only persists for about one picosecond, and all the response you see after here, after this main peak, are uh, responses that they're, they're without any applied electric field on it. So you can sort of think of this as an impulsive response from the impulsive terrorist pulse excitation. So here's, uh, so as we cool down the temperature, uh, we start, we, we first see that the stop mode, which is a pair from here, that's moving uh, to lower frequency as we lower the temperature. Uh, at even lower temperature, we actually start to see uh, three new special modes that appear at lower frequencies. So, considering that actually TIFFISH is a symmetry selective measurement and uh, that is sensitive only to IR active responses, the appearance of these modes provides the first indication that inversion symmetry breaking has happened, thus allowing otherwise symmetry forbidden modes to be observed uh, in, a, in the detection. So, if we actually take a closer look, and the frequencies of these modes, of these new modes, will find that they are. <coughs> oh, an important thing is that there are actually. <coughs> sorry, there are actually four modes. There are only four modes in this frequency range. Um, two. So in, in the equilibrium phase, there are four modes in these frequency ranges. In this frequency range, two of them is IR. Two of them is IR is run active. So um, yeah, actually, if you uh, take a look at the frequencies of these modes, though, you will find that they are actually all hardening with temperature, which is yet another good indication that we are indeed in the ferroelectric state. Um, however, it's important uh, to confirm that what we saw is indeed a terahertz field induced effect that actually changes the material to a different phase, rather than just some low, uh, low temperature equilibrium modes that happens to be there for some reason. Um, so we also conducted a terahertz field strength dependency experiment at 5K. So as you can see, um, as we increase the terahertz field strength, uh, the spectrum of the, the phonon excitation spectrum changes completely. So, especially if you compare the, uh, the phonon spectrum at the, at the lowest terahertz field strength, where you only have a single spectrum mode there, that's the soft mode we are driving. But as you increase the terahertz field strength, the, the multiple modes start to appear. 
and eventually uh, that that will lead to be associated with the phase transformation. Um, if you also actually take a look at the uh, time domain response, uh, the corresponding time domain response, uh, if you uh, look at here, a small increase in the terrorist field strength, this is the tiny, tiny increase in the terrorist field strength, actually this is the doubling of the, of the non-oscillatory signal component, which, uh, is a, which indicates uh, the, the rise of a steady state dipole ordering. So if we will actually um, take a look closer at here, so that uh, so as we increase the field strength, uh, uh, the non-oscillatory signal actually stays longer and becomes flatter at this region, which indicates that the ions actually stay at an off-standard position for quite a while before they relax back. So this is a, yeah, another indication that we are in a ferroelectric state. And it's, it's a metastable, yeah, I need to emphasize it's a metastable ferroelectric state. Um, that lasts for about 10 picoseconds. So, uh, in order to confirm our findings, we also detect uh, the Raman active set of the phonon response. So again, here in the temperature dependence, we observe very similar response as what we got uh, from the TIFISH, which uh, is a good, good sign that in, from both symmetry sets, we uh, saw similar responses that agrees well with our symmetry breaking uh, uh, picture. Uh, what's most striking, actually, is that if you actually look at the uh, uh, terahertz field strength in this experiment that we did in 10K. Uh, so these new modes actually behave in a highly nonlinear fashion. So, uh, so as pointed out by the black arrows here, a small increase in the terahertz field strength here is like 34% increase from the 600, uh, 470 kilometers per centimeter to 630 kilometers per centimeter. This was 700% increase in the, in the um, uh, phonon, phonon special amplitude, which, so this is a clearly a highly nonlinear behavior that's most likely to be associated with the phase transformation. <coughs> yes, also there's a consistency that this mode actually behaves normally, uh, just like what we expect. Uh, so, uh, so in order to, so this, this conclusion is actually supported uh, by the MD simulation from our collaborator Andrew. Uh, whose studies actually shows that a, um, a sharp increase in the global polarization can be induced when the uh, applied the terahertz field strength exceeds a threshold value that is similar to what we used in the experiment. So, so this basically uh, quickly uh, summarized my experiment. Uh, so in today's talk, I. Uh, present to you one of our recent experiments where we use strong terahertz pulses to drive a large amplitude ferroelectric phonon, uh, ferroelectric phonons, and therefore induce the quantum ferroelectric to a ferroelectric phase transition uh, on an ultra fast time scale using a with only a single cycle of terahertz pulse excitation. So, uh, as a, as some future steps, we are we are now developing a new nonlinear multi-dimensional nonlinear optical pump probe techniques in order to review the detailed couplings and as well as the interaction pathways between different modes and the, the light matter interactions. Uh, we, also, we are also planning to use femtosecond x-rays to directly observe the structural changes after associated with the terrorist pulse excitation, uh, as well as the, the, the nanoscale um, fine structures in the material. There are tons of details that I have left over uh, during the presentation, but uh, this will be important. To understand. Uh, also, that our approach is general enough such that <coughs> we can use a similar approach to uh, excite the other degrees of freedom, such as that, for example, we can use the terrorist pulse to drive phonons, and therefore they, they, are, they can sometimes couple to magnetic excitations in materials, say, in multifluids. So before I stop, I would just want to briefly mention another project that we are recently been working on, uh, that is to use the strong terrorist pulse to drive, uh, to, to manipulate the topological surface space by driving ferroelectric phonons in the topological crystal insulator. So in this class of topological insulators, the, the topological surface states are protected by mirror symmetry instead of time reversal symmetry. So this. Uh, so if we drive a ferroelectric phonon that's modulating this equivalent symmetry, we may have a chance to modulate the surface states themselves 
So this provides a handle for us to control the topology on the ultra-fast time scale. So, uh, so here's the experiment we did. Uh, so, so this is, again, a Kfish experiment. So we, uh, we observe a clear signatures. Uh, so this material is Latin telluride uh, alloy. So this, this particular composition is 0.5.5. .5. Um, <coughs> so in, uh, in the Kfish experiment, we clearly observe uh, signatures of ferroelectric uh, phonon, ferroelectric ferro softmo, as well, as well as a ferroelectric phase transition. So you can see that uh, the phonon peak here is, is getting wider and wider and wider until they, they harden again. <coughs> You can, you, can, you can see that. Uh, so this is a clear proof that there is a ferroelectric phase transition in this material. And uh, it has been shown theoretically that uh, ferroelectric distortion are able to open gaps on the direct, point, in, on the direct points of the topological surfaces. And uh, so this will then provide the opportunity to control an ultra-fast time scale. And actually, uh, there's another observation we I left over here. I, I can put included here. That is, we actually observe uh, basically concurrent um, oscillations that basically follow exactly the trend as in the phonon oscillation in the optical refractivity after a terrorist pulse excitation. So we need to establish the link between the phonon excitations as well as the oscillations in the optical refractivity. So we have a missing link in the middle. That is. That is how does the, the, the ferroelectric distortion actually modulate the, uh, the electronic structure and therefore give rise to observa uh, observable as the optical refractivity? So we hope that we can find someone that's filling the gap in the middle to uh, help us uh, understand the story of uh, this experiment. Okay. Okay, that's the, uh, the last thing I have. So I would like to end my presentation by thanking uh, my collaborators at both MIT and UPenn as well as our funding agency, uh, uh, DOE Office of Science. Thank you very much, uh, and I'd like to take any questions. Thank you, Shen. We have time for a number of questions. Okay. Yes, uh, I take uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, Very nice experiment, so congratulations. Uh, Thank you. It's achievement. Um, I wonder uh, whether you can comment what are the uh, three or four modes which you have observed in strontium titanate, and it's also true. what was the direction of the polarization of the trans pulse with respect to crystallographic axis? Um, it's complicated. Uh, this is a hard question, actually. This is a question, actually, we hope that Andrew can help <laughs> us answer. So uh, there are multiple interactions in this, in this uh, experiment. So uh, actually, we realized multiple things that's happening at the same time uh, in the experiment. Uh, one thing is it's kind of clear that even for the experiment, we see that when we increase the terrorist field strength, the peak actually moves. So the, the, actually, the, the phonon special actually, actually can blue shift if you actually increase the field strength. That complicated the thing. Also, that when you uh, induce the ferroelectric phase transition, uh, the modes can actually split, and because uh, two of the modes here are actually double degenerate, so they split, and they actually uh, after they split, they can actually harden very quickly. So therefore, it's kind of hard to understand which one is which exactly. And but we we are uh, uh, we have evidence to show that this this peak, this very broad peak, actually is the Raman active mode. Although this is the IR active uh, uh, phonon spectrum, but so uh, we still is able to see a Raman active mode. Uh, because uh, and this mode we believe is the A1G mode that's associated with the oxygen cage rotation. So uh, so uh, we believe that the mechanism here is basically uh, when we drive the IR uh, soft modes, uh, the interactive soft modes hard enough, uh, we can have like so-called ionic Raman scattering, which is basically an enharmonic coupling to the other modes. So when so this gives rise to the excitation of this Raman mode, and and on the two D 